Yes. Yes, Rick. Yeah, I was actually talking to John Collins today. And, um, That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're conversing on it, but apparently there's some other systems also uh, happening in Europe. Avalanche Guard and some other mobile and exploding <coughs> devices. If you can comment on any of those that you're aware of. We are aware of um, a few of these devices. Uh, they do seem to be fairly effective. Um, there are some explosive storage issues in the United States that don't apply in European countries. And uh, there may be concerns uh, regarding the, the storage of explosives out in a remote area that would, could possibly be accessible. There are some aspects of those devices that make them a little bit less desirable than the Gazex. Uh, one is the number of times you can use them in a given winter before you have to resupply them or in a, in a long storm cycle. Um, the Gazex, uh, the two exploders that we have in above Snowbird, uh, only require replenishing the uh, supply once during the winter. Um, in some locations where you carried out avalanche control work on a less frequent <coughs> basis, something like some of those alternatives that you're discussing would probably be uh, more of an option. It seems like currently that the Gazex is best suited from what we can determine for what we're looking at in Little Cottonwood Canyon where we do a tremendous amount of avalanche control work. Yeah, uh, one last question. Is the military concerned about, uh, in, in <coughs> sort of, I mean, our experiences at the squad in the old days with the avalanche were not very good, but is the military is it concerned about avalanches and would they work in uh, this area? The military is not concerned about avalanches because that's a commercially produced uh, uh, technology. Um, they would work in some locations. They are, as you know, uh, the range and accuracy, especially during the conditions which you most like, most normally need to carry out avalanche control work, are a little bit suspect. But they are uh, very effectively used uh, within the ski areas of Alta and Stobart, for instance. The range requirements and would be, depending upon where the avalanche was located, once again, when you position the artillery, you don't want to have it down in a, in a place where it's liable to be overrun by an avalanche that the gun crew starts. That's why the Pea Ridge rifle is located where it is up on a ridge top, so it's not going to be overrun. If an avalanche at that same spot would not be able to reach all the targets that the Pea Ridge rifle could, so you would have to find other sites to fire the avalanche from because of its range and accuracy limitations, and those would be a little bit hard to come by. Yes? You, sir, with the purple, beautiful purple shirt. <coughs> One of uh, your New York forecasters spoke at a symposium last fall and highlighted the potential conflicts between dog controllers and your need to, to shoot these areas. <coughs> you didn't bring that up as Part of the problem. Is that a serious issue? It would be a serious issue if anybody in this room was up there in close proximity to where a round detonated. Um, early morning skiing has become very popular in the last five, six years. That's when uh, we carry out a lot of the control work. Um, not necessarily because the avalanches have a alarm clock, but it, it's in order to accommodate the, you know, the traffic on the road, which is related to the opening and closing of ski resorts. People skiing uh, in the avalanche starting zones uh, is a huge concern. Uh, it would be a horrible tragedy to, uh, I mean, the, these, when these rounds go off, they're, they're anti-personnel rounds, and they have a tremendous amount of shrapnel, and they are, they're designed to kill people and blow things up. We go to great lengths to try to keep people informed about when we're going to carry out control work. I'm sure many of you are aware of the uh, hotline and the website. We also have, a, have signs at the bottom of the trailhead and we get up at four in the morning and start driving up and down the road to chase some of you fine people out of there <laughs> and send you in other places. Um, and I'm sure it must be pretty disappointing, but I would really encourage all of you to to, act, to use this uh, website or the hotline to find out what's going on so that you don't make that trip in vain. But it is, it's a big issue, yeah.
Yes, ma'am. I know we're talking about in the absence of artillery use above Alta, you know, what would be our options, but so what would happen then if there was no artillery for like white pine shoots, things like that? <laughs> That's okay, we have a, never mind. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> um, um, that would be, a, if, if we lost artillery tomorrow, if something, if, if in Jackson Hole, they put a round through the restaurant there, uh, or, or, some, or Alaska or anywhere, and the Army says, okay, you guys can't have these weapons and ammunition anymore. I guess, first of all, uh, the, the, the uh, ski industry would be knocking on the doors of the senators to plead with the Forest Service and the Army to make something uh, possible for us. But we would be in, in serious problem. We wouldn't be able to open the road. It would stay closed until natural stabilization could take place or until the weather improved and we could do helicopter bombing. Um, in the mid-canyon area where the White Pine Chutes are located, um, my personal opinion, I think, is that that is a place where artillery is very effective. Uh, there are wilderness issues that would not allow the placement of permanent facilities like the GAZX or any other of the avalanche control devices there. But in the wilderness bill that was passed in the early 70s for uh, the uh, Salt Lake Twins wilderness area, in the language of that bill it says that uh, in, avalanche control work with artillery and explosives can be carried out there, but no permanent structures. So if we were to lose the artillery, we would have to do something different, either protect the road, move the road, or try to use something like the GAZX, which would be uh, another six, seven, eight, whatever, ten million dollars in that area, plus the accessibility would make it pretty difficult to make it work. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the uh, howitzer as a replacement for the recoilless rifle. Uh, are there problems with that? I mean, if, if the recoilless rifle has been doing such a good job for you for 30, 50 years, and the howitzer is a better weapon, what's the problem with replacing the recoilless rifle with the howitzer and off you go? That is, that is our plan. We, we, as I said, we have a limited supply of this ammunition left, probably <coughs> maybe five, six years. And uh, regardless of what the Army tells us they want us to do as far as operational uh, concerns go, we would then have to replace the uh, um, recoilless rifle with the howitzer. I, I want to say that, what's, as you have just mentioned, this recoilless rifle, which is a fairly antiquated system and pretty simple, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have to be a, you know, a genius to work one. No offense, Arno. Um, <laughs> um, but it has been, it's, it has never not done what it's supposed to do. The ammunition fires uh, uh, as it's designed, it travels as it's designed, and it detonates most of the time. There are a few duds. Um, so regardless of whether the Army is forcing us to make these changes or the we exhaust our ammunition supply. That is our plan. UDOT has uh, actually funded um, the money to hopefully rebuild the Peruvian Ridge Mountain in the next one or two years to replace it with howitzer.